Uh, I am honored to invite Mr. Ari Vatanen, farmer from Tuvavara and France, former MEP and especially World Rally Champion. So uh, welcome uh, Ari. Ari to the discussion. Maybe you can share your picture. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, wait a second. Yeah, no problem at all. And I can uh, start asking some questions from you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I was uh, to start my video. Yes, I'm, we can see you perfectly. Am I visible now? Yes, you are visible very well. Luckily, luckily, my wife was listening to this. Uh, you and I heard, I think they are calling you, they're calling you. So <laughs> I'm out of breath now. <laughs> yeah, no problem at all. It's been a long day for you to wait, but hopefully you have got also some ideas from these discussions from, from today. And we are keen to hear about you and your career as an entrepreneur. Uh, uh, many steps on it during the year. So how did you originally ended up to become a rural entrepreneur and which kind of businesses you have had during your career and this, during these years? Oh, yes, yes. Just, uh, good, af good afternoon, everybody. Mesdames et Messieurs and everybody else, uh, ladies, and, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, uh, well, if you don't, uh, I have always difficulty to, to stay under any title. I mean, I saw this, um, the title, my my development as an entrepreneur, entrepreneur. And I've been listening, you know, occasionally uh, this discussion uh, discussion today. And uh, because we have to admit that uh, by and large, the entrepreneurship has been um, missing in, in agriculture, obviously. Because in, in Europe it's a, it's a heavily subsidized uh, uh, financial activity, and you know I come from a farming totally from farming background. My my ancestors, my grandfather, my father uh, uh, was a, uh, have been, and my, my father was a, uh, a farm you know farmer. And unfortunately, he died when I was only eight years of age in a car accident. And by the way, I was in the car with him, but that's another story. But it gives a sort of depth into what I what I think. But anyway, my, wa my mother told me that uh, when my father got the first rye, rye bread uh, 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 out of the oven in, a, in a autumn time, how happy he felt because there was a one year of work behind it. And, and of course, um, uh, observed, so he looked at a certain kind of humility because you realize that you're part of nature, you are part of that, that, that big cycle, and you can determine, it's not a mathematical equation where you, well, let's put this amount of fertilizers, let's put this amount of this and that, and, and then you all add up and you know how many, how many kilograms you will get. No, it doesn't work like that. So, so he was very happy when he, when he got his uh, bread out of the oven and of course we had would you believe four cows four cows and four hectares well of course you you, you understand that it's not uh, <laughs> it's not really a financial activity but luckily we had timber uh, timber on, on 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 top of it and as far as the entrepreneurship is uh, concerned let's face it i remember when the milk cow came every milk cow milk milk lorry rather came to pick up the milk every morning the, uh, the entrepreneurship of a farm or finished when the lorry had disappeared behind the corner. So you actually just produce something. And then somebody else takes care of marketing, takes care of, you know, the development, takes care of, uh, you know, um, developing the value, value, value chain. So farmer is not really entrepreneur in a real sense of the word. And of course, the whole discussion is so politically loaded. I'm sorry, I'm, my, my own career, maybe I don't answer to your question, but I, I want to have a bigger, to, uh, to, uh, to try to look at the bigger picture, because this whole uh, discussion is so politically loaded, because it's uh, ideology loaded. And so uh, we don't analyze situations, like in you know, politics, we don't do very often. 
and 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 the ideology determines what we what we do and um, um, uh, my personal view is that we underestimate the uh, human capacity to innovate and we only innovate when we are obliged to when, when we are obliged to do so so uh, so the the, uh, the development happens when we have to do and we have always underestimated the 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 you know the the, the speed of technology how it how it uh, how it improves and after second world war you know europe had a big challenge just simply producing food and uh, and and we have to keep on you know increasing gain in productivity and now when you uh, like what I heard today, but that's nothing new because in a politics you just talk about slogans. You we talk about slogans all the, all the, all the time. And now when today we hear very often that uh, because after Second World War, uh, one farmer fed I can't remember roughly in France maybe seven families. Now one farmer maybe can feed today uh, I don't know seventy families or maybe many many more families because we have gained in our productivity. And when we gain in our productivity, we are eradicating poverty. And we need to keep on doing that because we forget that most of the world do live in the poverty today. You know, and when I hear now that we are throwing out the window what the science has brought us, I mean, what, what we have learned over the decades and, and to, to increase our productivity. And to increase productivity, it means reducing waste. That's what it means, because, you know, when you go up in a productivity chain, you know, we use less physical, we use less muscles, we use less time, we use less resources. So we can produce more with less. We can produce, and that's the, and otherwise, if we don't keep this principle in, in any walk of life, what we do, I mean, we cannot bring people out of poverty and, and we need to keep on going that, that way. And uh, so if we now go back to, let's say, we start circular economy, that we don't do commerce anymore or we do less, uh, that we all are self-sufficient more or less in what we, what we do. Well, that's not the way to do. And how is an organic farming a way to reduce famine in the world. No, it isn't. So, so we need to uh, we need to keep on increasing our pro productivity because if the you know we can have organic farming, but not in a subsidized manner, because uh, because uh, organic farming can happen in rich countries, and we forget that organic farming is all what they have in the poor poor countries. You know, I've been in Mali in Burkina Faso, in Niger, in, you know, those countries, they are the poorest countries of the world. And there, they only have organic farming because they are totally, let's say, at the mercy of the nature. So, so and now we are uh, going in a way back to that, that we start, uh, uh, you know, throwing out of the window what science has, uh, has brought us. So, um, so my answer to, my answer is that, uh, we need to uh, just, uh, you know, uh, applying technology and, uh, and, and give a hope to a people because let's say if we rich countries, if you go into degrowth, like, uh, like I have heard even the opening remark, <laughs> I heard moderate lifestyles, they are very, up, <laughs> they are very appearing t titles, but it's a, a rather cynical approach to life, life because, um, Man has to always go, uh, you know, uh, uh, has to go forward, has to go forward and degrowth. If rich countries go into degrowth, what actually people are either directly or indirectly proposing. That means, well, that means that we have difficulties to pay pensions. It means that we have, um, uh, we have, um, you know, more, un more un unemployment and so forth, and public death will increase. But, you know, we can survive because we are very wealthy. 
But if rich countries don't go forward, so then uh, poorer countries, you know, famine is a result. So I just want to like paint a bigger picture because you know that instead of speaking to our people who may vote for us, but you know, because people need hope, people need hope. And if the poorer countries, people don't have hope. If we now started, we say, let's, we don't buy flowers from Kenya because I want to buy subsidized Finnish flowers. Well, that's a new kind of a racism. And how can people in Kenya, which is not one of the poorest African countries at all, how can they have a hope if, they, if we don't buy their products? And we must remember that transport cost is included in their, in their, um, in their uh, you know, uh, price. And they are, if they are competitive, so we need international commerce. We cannot again have a, like a closed, uh, closed borders and just do it for ourselves. And so we have uh, so many other things we can do well. So we, we should specialize more in agriculture. For example, in, in Finland, we have nightless nights. What about instead of making organic food? Well, I understand organic food. If we had a problem with the conventionally produced food, but scientifically and medically speaking, we don't have a problem with conventionally produced food. You know, this cannot be, agriculture cannot be some wishful thinking. So, but if we had a problem with uh, conventional food, okay, let's, let's then, let's then, uh, then, then fix it. But that's not, the, that's not, the, not the case. So with our nightless night, for example, what about with the GMO technology? Because that's what we have to do. For example, the term genetically modified, you know, it's, it's a wrong term. It's like Pekka Besson has said very well, it's genetically improved because everything is already genetically improved. And now, thanks to current technology, we can be very specific in our genetic improvements. So we can have a healthy, instead of organic milk, we should have a milk with some, you know, healthy properties, health properties. Imagine how much money we could get and, and other food products because our nightless night gives our, um, you know, Nordic countries this, uh, you know, unique opportunity to produce like a niche products. And then you could have a charge and a <clears throat> much higher price for your end product, end, end product. And so that's the way to go for my, not, not to go backwards in the technology. I mean, that was great, a great answer. And I know when we talked before this discussion that um, you have before been growing wine, winery, but nowadays you have olives and you told me a really nice story about how you have improved your own uh, added value to the olive products. Maybe you could share that one. <laughs> more, more to practice. Yes, we produce one also not we don't produce wine anymore. And uh, so we we well we produce uh, you know lavender lavender and uh, and uh, and and olives and by the way <laughs> i just looked at the olive production looks very good um, because it's very uh, like there's some range aleatuar you know it goes up and down you cannot guarantee at all the 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 the, the harvest uh, the the harvest level so but this year it looks actually very good last year was um, uh, you know uh, really not good at all but anyway, let's say the one fifth, uh, fifth of my olive, olives are already on the, on the ground. Why? Because this year I, not, I did not read them. I, I did kind of organic thing. I did not read them um, with any chemical products. And the result is that the pests have, have attacked, not unluckily, not the entire production, but let's say roughly maybe one fifth of it. And the, all, the olives have already fallen. Those, let's say, fifth of the olive oil, olives have fallen down because the pests, when they attack olives, they actually don't stay in the tree anymore. Just because I did not read them. So it's okay for me, but when that happens to a poor country, that would be a very, very, very bad thing. Anyway, so instead of selling now olives as olives, as we used to do, um, we then, in a local mill, we turn it into, into olive oil, and then I'm marking it under under my name and I sell it actually to BMW dealers in France. So because um, dealers, they normally traditionally, they give a champagne bottle to, um, to, uh, to car, car buyers. So I, I'm trying to convince them to, uh, to give them an uh, olive oil bottle 
uh, bottle and actually the, uh, on the other side on the etiquette it actually says that you know no rule patrol which which says don't drive too fast just to remind so so uh, so each bmw dealer will have their you know my personalized etiquette but with their their name printed on the etiquette so so because some paint bottle will be thrown into a little, a little bin uh, immediately whereas that kind of olive bottle will stay on the table and of course they will refill it and the name of the dealer will stay on the on the dinner table so for example that's an idea and now it seems to take two or three years for people to accept that they could give a olive oil instead of some pain some pain uh, to, uh, to car buyers but it's now uh, gaining ground so let's hope <laughs> let's hope <laughs> no more olives will fall on the, on the ground <laughs> this year and so i will be able to make olive oil mm. Yeah, but I like that example, that the added value can be a very easy innovation of everyday life and you can multiply the income. And it's, you were... and it's the only way, it's the only way to, you know, to produce uh, these products and in order to produce these products, we need the latest technology. And uh, for me, it's incredible to think that we are throwing out of the window and just because people think that organic farming somehow something wrong with the conventional farming. If there was something wrong with the conventional farming, we need to fix it. But we cannot, we cannot go back in a, in, a, in a productivity. That is, uh, that, that is a very cynical way to approach. You were working in the European Parliament, both in Finnish, under the Finnish flag and under the French flag, which is a very unique situation. Uh, during those years, uh, which were the best policies or instruments you feel were promoting the rural business? Do you have some examples from that career? Hardly. I, don't know, I can't. I, I won't be able to pin, <laughs> give you any any answer to pin pinpoint. Um, pinpoint answer to that, but generally speaking, the entrepreneurship in a political circles, even in the, in the, in the, in the, <laughs> so, uh, you know, con conventionally speaking, the right, right hand side of the political spectrum is, is very, very rare because um, people who are politicians are, you know, they come from normally from a political background and some of them are yeah, normally, all of them have worked in a, in a public sector when somebody else has taken a risk de themselves. So actually, entrepreneur politicians who have uh, who have given their houses a collateral to to take a loan and then take a new business, as you have done personally, you know, <laughs> in your in your hotel business in in Yonsu, which I now I, I looked at your net side and realized, and I take my hat off for you. Anyway, that's very very rare in the in the in the politics. And and just to give you an idea, the the lobbyists are seen as something negative. And I always welcome the lobbyists to see me. But who are the lobbyists? Lo lobbyists are people who actually run a certain kind of business. And they were, you know, sort of begging to have rendezvous with the MEPs that they would be able to tell, well, if you do this and this legislation, what we were going to do, well, this would be the consequences at the grassroots level. And very often politicians, um, don't even receive them to hear what the consequences would be. So I I, I regret that. Um, and and um, and let's say in the let's say in the USA, USA has got lots of things I don't uh, agree at all with. But you know, there the, this entrepreneurship, it is totally it's a, it's a culture, the entrepreneurship. And 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 look at in Finland, for example, you and myself, we come from the eastern part of Finland, where we have a much higher unemployment rate than in the western part of Finland. And that has been traditionally always been like that. So, and particularly when you go, for example, in Finland, you go to Swedish speaking areas of Finland, their unemployment rate has always been much lower than in the Finnish speaking areas of Finland. And that's what I can, and many Finnish speaking people can't even admit that. Well, I can, I can, I can admit it and we should learn from that. So it's, it's a kind of a culture when the entrepreneurship and when you think of English word, self-employed, I think it's a beautiful word, providing you are able-bodied person. We all should be self-employed people. But what do people expect? They want to somebody else to give them work. That's what the starting point. And course, it's not a healthy starting point. So, but let's hope the, the you know, the, 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 you know, cultures will change, but they will only change when it is necessary. 
as long as, because man is an, an intellectual creature, so if we can get something easily, we will grab it, of course. But if we will have to do something, we will do. And we very often, we underestimate the people's capacity to innovate, but we only innovate when it's necessary. And political, you know, political world doesn't always oblige us to innovate. You were comparing the Eastern and Western Finnish culture. Can you see the similar um, like differences between the European countries? You have been living and uh, doing business in many countries. So how you are feeling the biggest differences and biggest similarities? No, that is very, very good. Uh, very good. Um, a very good uh, point. I still remember, you know, Commissioner Liikanen, who was there uh, in, <laughs> when, when I happened to be in Brussels, he often told this example that when you go to New York and it starts raining, in no time at all, you have some young guys who, who will be selling you um, parapluie, you know, uh, come on, um, umbrellas, <laughs> umbrellas in English, umbrellas. But in, 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 uh, in and he, when Mr. Liikanen said, when I, when I fly back to Finland, and, um, and it starts raining and I don't have an umbrella in a, in a city of Helsinki, you must go to Stockman, the seventh floor of the Stockman to find, a, find an umbrella because the Finnish legislation would forbid some young people to work in rain, literally. Anyway, so the cultures are so different. And, and, and of course, I can see it in France, um, in south of France, where we live near Marseille. It's, um, uh, uh, you know, traditionally, you know, people enjoy sun instead of... Um, working I mean it's a bit of a caricature and then whereas in 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 a northern part of uh, France near near Switzerland uh, you know uh, or uh, near 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 Germany it's like a little bit like in the Germany and maybe a even bigger bigger cultural difference in Italy if you think about uh, southern southern Italy and then you think about the northern Italy which could be like in Switzerland but one country where I think we all should learn from, and I say that this is a fully committed European, and I understand why, why Switzerland is not in Europe, and I don't, I don't uh, hope that they will never be in part of Europe. Why? Because it's kind of a conscious uh, test for, for Europeans. Look at Switzerland. Switzerland could be the Albania of, uh, of Europe. They have nothing is, they, they haven't inherited anything, you know, mountains, extremely mountainous country, not even access to a sea, whereas Albania has access to a sea. And, um, and so everything is very difficult in Switzerland, uh, you know, farming, roads, whatever. And yet it's by far the richest country in, in, in Europe. Why? Because, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, they work more than other people work. I'm not saying it's a paradise, not at all. But you know, an average person in Switzerland works at least 42 hours per week. In in France, 35 hours per week. But that's a one one day less per week. I mean, more uh, uh, grossly speaking. And if you do that, generation after generation, you will accumulate wealth. And so um, there's no uh, you know secret um, uh, you know recipe for for. For, for success, it's it's hard working, and and um, of course in terms of Europe, the only way for us to go forward is technology and innovation and accepting a new technology. And um, for example, in the very first um, opening speech, when when Doctor uh, was a professor who spoke, with all due credit to him who spoke, he didn't mention a word, for example, nuclear. He was talking all alternative very expensive energy producing, but nuclear was not mentioned because it's not politically correct to mention. So we cannot develop Europe if we exclude something in the terms of ideology. We have to just simply analyze. We have to put all our ingredients on the on table and, and to use them and we, and we will survive. And, and, but at the same time, we must also give hope to the people who live in the poorest part of the world. And I'm sorry to say, they earn less a day than the European cow gets subsidies a day. And come on, we live in a very same planet and don't be surprised if they nearly swim across Mediterranean because they're hopeless people. And nothing can stop a hopeless people. So our duty in a far bigger sense is to give hope to everybody. 
Thank you, Ari. That has been an interesting story. Uh, there would be space for one uh, audience question, if, if there many, would be. Yeah, if you <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think uh, we are reaching that time, but if there would be one or two questions from the audience, I would be happy to share. Of course, I have one extra question on my paper also, but, but if some of you would be quick, please take a floor. At least on the chat box, there has been some comment on the organic farming, but maybe that's something you can uh, continue on the chat box. But uh, I have one more final question. Uh, what would, would be your top uh, three tips for the rural entrepreneurs? For example, these young, uh, young uh, farmers today on the videos, uh, what was, would be your top, top tip for them to reach the desired uh, goal 2040, desired future 2040? Well, I, if I was a magician, if I was a magician, but I aren't, and there aren't magicians in, 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 that, uh, in that, uh, that sense as all. Well, all. Well, all I can say is to, to look far ahead, to look, uh, to look uh, far ahead, you know. I, you know, Ville, Ville, Ville Puhak in the beginning. I, I listened to his, uh, his his statement, and at the same time, the gentleman, I think Martin from from Slovakia, and of course Martin uh, was of course in a much more fortunate position because he has a really big farm and very verse, ver, uh, diversified, and he can run it as a as a really proper. Uh, you know, uh, enterprise, whereas obviously Ville will have far bigger difficulties. I know his farm very well. I've been there. I'm proud to know him and his, his, uh, his, his, um, his, his uh, parents. And, um, and he has a far bigger, far bigger uh, you know, difficulties, obviously, because in terms of size, that is, that is a problem. So we also have to ad admit that, you know, farming, when, when, when you can't reach a certain scale, you know, obviously your production cost is, is very high. So you have, a, you have only two, sol two solutions. You have to find something, uh, you know, first of all, you need to find a niche product, you know, a niche product um, where you have a added value, where you have an added, added value and, and you need to apply the latest, latest technology. And, um, or sometimes, sometimes then, you know, um, uh, obviously uh, there's no other solution for farm is too small. You cannot even find a solution that you have to then do, do, um, do something else. But then that's also the problem in the society as a whole that um, that you know the entrepreneurship should be you know uh, should be encouraged uh, should be encouraged more. But there's no, I can't give any any secret uh, secret advice. Look far ahead and apply the latest uh, technology. And if it doesn't work out, well then you have to do something else. Just as father has done something, just as father has done something, it's we have to accept these painful processes of uh, of the society. We have to accept that also, however painful it is. But okay, Ilomansi already has actually they have a uh, you know fiber optics to a certain extent as far as I know. So that gives and pandemic has now taught people also not everybody has to live in a seventh floor near railway station. So uh, so that has given us a new lease of life uh, for rural area and now we must um, make the most of it but you know you know fast connections obviously are are the, are the number number one thing although for example i'm sorry to say it is also loaded and politically in Fra in france there are mayors green mayors like in a Grenoble, for example big town near us and they don't want to have a fifth generation telecommunications because it's not part of green ideology so, you know, if you have this kind of um, this kind of attitude, we don't have a future, but uh, like a hope, let's hope the green mayors are, there are not too many of them. Thank you, Ari, for your, uh, uh, for your opinions and for your uh, sharing of your background. Uh, thank you very much. And now I will give the floor once more to Thomas Kuhmonen. Your task was today to uh, gather everything together, sorry. Yeah, it's here. <laughs> Gather all the findings from these four hours long afternoon uh, to a 10 minute conclusion. So which were the top things from today? Thomas. Thank you. <clears throat> I will share my screen like this. 
Um, yes, it has been a long day. And it was really exciting to hear that um, at least one member of the audience was awake during my provocative opening words, and he was the world champion, Ari Vatanen. And it was really Thank nice. <laughs> yes, uh, lots of nice insights. I had maybe lumped something like 100 bullet points, and I tried to sum it up very briefly to find out something uh, that makes sense. Uh, we, in a way, started uh, the thinking with the, the rural vision of the European Union. It's very broad, if you have read it. It's, in a way, all inclusive, and it makes it really hard to take it to the ground. So it includes everything for everybody. And that's, the, I think, the normal problem of a vision which has a very broad coverage. It should give something to everybody, but at the same time, it, it lacks the big picture. That's easily the problem. And it, it's really hard to, to figure out what it has to offer for people in a certain region or for the different types of entrepreneurs. Um, what came out in many of the um, uh, talks was that uh, uh, we need a lot of elaboration of alternatives. Um, if the farmers are blamed to be uh, the main cause of the climate change, it doesn't help. We need concrete proposal what they should be doing in their case, in their context, in their line of production, with their resources to make things better. So there's a lot of work to be done with the elaboration of, of the alternatives. And we need incentives at least as much or even more than restrictions. Hope was a key word by Ari. And I think also that it's one of the, the key words we need. If people don't have hope, if they don't have a vision for the future, they don't make investments. And if people don't make investments, physically or social or personal investments, uh, things won't change. So there will have to be some sort of a vision for a positive future for, for yourself, for your family, or for your business, or for your community, or for your region. And this would be the step towards the, the kind of better entrepreneurship culture and the, the obligation to innovate was also a very nice uh, phrase. We, we, we quite often, the structures and the practices do not change without a crisis. We have studied the history of the Finnish agriculture for 700 years, and only in major crises, the structures and the practices have changed a lot. That's, that's the kind of basic starting point. Um, I think the rural people feel that they are the target more than the kind of the, the actor, actor, actor or the contributor. And I think because uh, only rural businesses can sequestrate carbon, uh, there, there would be an option also to, to change this position from the, the pure defense even to an offense that we have a lot to offer, for example, for the, for the climate change. Uh, we have studied the, the future dreams of young people many times with lots of uh, random samples in Finland and in Europe. And uh, there is a great interest toward rural among the young people. And so the promotion of the new rural lifestyles is, I think, that there should be a continuing uh, campaign to show what we have to offer because all the time a larger share of people are living in, in the cities and they are not necessarily uh, familiar with the, the options we have in the countryside. And it's also partly related to the old fashioned image of the rural. Quite many people still have 
the image of old-fashioned, dull, nothing happens uh, in, in the rural. Uh, whereas if you look at the modern farms, it's, it's a high-tech profession. It, it's much more high-tech than many of the urban professions. So for example, these types of uh, visions would offer some perspectives of, for the young people because quite many people are interested in, in technology in a positive way. Another point, um, transparency of the society's value chains, the flow of money and metabolism, the flow of materials and energy. Like Becca said, we don't understand fully the, the value chains. They are not uh, fully visible. What, what happens, what's the value, what's the contribution of different stages of or participants of the food chain, for example. And in that way, we could reach a better understanding how the society works, where the materials come, where the energy come, where the money comes, where they go. And uh, all, all, for example, like um, blaming just farmers for the climate change. Well, we don't have any production that wouldn't exist because of consumption. Hardly anyone has uh, money enough to produce olives for five years without a buyer. So there's always a reason for the production and now, the, the, the public debate quite often blames just one activity or one uh, group of actors, for example, for the, for the climate change. Uh, and also that's the way to make the externality, externalities more visible like the climate change, which is an externality of, of the fossil economy. And it's also a way to make the steps toward the post-carbon society easier to see and easier to take. Like for example, if you think about climate change, uh, the possibilities to produce food will deteriorate close to the, the Mediterranean in Northern Africa, in Central Africa, in, in the, in the, in, in the uh, Near East, for example. Uh, and these um, regions are expected to have a very rapid population growth up to 2050. So they should be producing more food than today, much more food, and the climate change will reduce their capacity to produ produce food. And this uh, kind of uh, equation, how to solve it? because if the people there, they are quite young, they won't be there waiting for uh, starvation, they will move. And so we could have something like 500 million climate refugees. So that was also a good point made by Ari that we, we really need to think also things that are outside Europe because for example, concerning the impacts of the climate change, the biggest impacts could come from the outside and not from the inside of Europe. Okay, final point. Um, it's quite often that uh, especially people who are not themselves living in the rural areas or then people who have been living in the rural areas for a long time, think that there are not really many possibilities. Well, we had a Horizon 2020 project, it's still running called Ruralization. Uh, and we scanned uh, the prevailing trends in different parts of Europe, from the local newspapers, from, from the any kinds of sources. And what we identified 1,560 different types of trends. And we synthesize them into 60 trend cards. You can find them in the website, worldtrends.eu. And I just picked up uh, eight trend cards. We have these trend cards, which are related to the discussions we have had today, like alternative food systems, community-based action, food security, manifestations of new technologies, remote work, 
rural in the social media, rural lifestyle and sustainability transition. And there are 52 more trends. And if you look at the report, you can find 1,560 trends. So many things and many developments are taking place across Europe. And it's always possible to find out something new and find out some nice, interesting opportunities which are possible within one's own objectives and within the resources one has at his hand or her hand. Thank you. It was a really nice uh, meeting today. Thank you, Thomas. It was excellent uh, summarizing or summary of the day. And